Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. We resume our study in verse 24 today. I hope you're enjoying this book of Colossians. It's only four chapters, but it's all about the preeminence and the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, extremely valuable, especially for today, when there's so much watered down truth about Jesus. We'll get it straight from God himself, as we always do here on Scripture Verse by Verse. And by the way, if you would like to study all of the Bible with me, verse by verse, you can do it four times all the way through because there are four series archives from over 35 years at the scripture verse by verse website and that is found at the bible verse by verse dot com so i encourage you to go there and bring your bible because that's all you need and a hunger for god's word once there choose click and listen all right let's pray father we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth your word is truth in jesus name amen Paul writes, remember, he's writing to Christians. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. When Jesus suffered on the cross and died, pain for our sins the last thing that he said was it is finished that means that Jesus suffered all that needed to be suffered in order to pay the penalty for our sins he did not have to go to hell and do hand to hand combat with Satan as the Word of Faith teachers teach. That is completely unbiblical. That is a fairy tale. And I suppose the reason that they say it is because God told them, because you certainly can't find anything even remotely close to that in Scripture. He said it is finished before he died. You can't add anything to the sufferings of Jesus Christ. He didn't have to do anything beyond what he did on the cross. He did it all. And like I said, you can't add anything to the sufferings of Jesus in hopes of earning your salvation or your forgiveness. The cross accomplished everything that we need for forgiveness and eternal life and to escape hell. The sufferings of Jesus' death are complete. But the sufferings of his life continue in and through faithful Christians. That is what Paul is describing here. This is our calling as Christians. This is God's will that we live for Jesus, that we live the Holy Word of God, that we speak the Word of God, without watering it down to please lukewarm Christians, without watering it down to try to be cool in the eyes of the world. That is an abomination in the eyes of Almighty God to do that. Jesus never watered down the word of God to get along with anybody. He spoke the truth of God's word. Most people rejected it and he let them go because Jesus wasn't trying to win a popularity contest. He was trying to represent accurately the Father and the Word of Almighty God, which is what he did to perfection. So this is God's will, that we live for Jesus, confess when we fail, that we live the Word, we speak the Word, We don't compromise our holiness to please anyone. We don't compromise the word of God to please anyone. 
This is the will of God that as we live like Jesus lived and suffer during our lives like he suffered during his, then we are allowing the sufferings of Christ to continue through us. And in that sense, Paul is making up in his body for the sufferings of Christ that lack. That's all that's talking about. And you and I do the same thing when we live for Jesus. It's his will. It's his will that we suffer. It's his will that we be ostracized. It's his will that we be mocked for telling the truth. It's his will that we not be popular. It's his will that we not be celebrities if we're preachers. It's not God's will for us to be celebrities. It's God's will for you and I as Christians to be faithful and therefore make up for the sufferings of Christ that were lacking while he was here. It's still going on. So when you get persecuted or you get ostracized or people mock you or hit you or spit on you or whatever, they, or kill you, they're not doing that primarily to you. They're doing that primarily to Jesus. The sufferings of Christ continue in you and I. That's what he's talking about. Jesus was despised and rejected of man a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That's what the Bible said. If to some degree we are not despised and not rejected, if we are not men and women of sorrow, if we are not acquainted with grief at the hands of the world and at the hands of lukewarm Christians, then we are not living for Jesus the way we should. We are compromising Christ expects us to fill up that which is behind in his afflictions. And believe me, you don't have to go looking for trouble as a Christian. It'll come to you. If you live for Jesus, it'll find you. But that's what we're called to. 25. Of which I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Anyone who thinks that being a minister is a career or a job, anybody who thinks that being a minister is a profession should get out of the ministry. I know that's how, they, how it is, though, in modern evangelicalism. I know it. I, I, I was in it for many years. I seen it. It, it grieved me. I saw it firsthand. There's so many other ungodly, unbiblical things. But that was one of them. I'll tell you one story. Many years ago, and I was, well, how old was I in the Lord? Maybe five, six years old in the Lord. I was just getting ready to start Scripture verse by verse. I do remember that when I was going to this church. And, uh, and of course, he told me, don't do it. I told him what I do. God, you know, I prayed about it for two years. Every day I prayed about it for two years. I did. I walked and I prayed every morning for two years. That's how cautious I was before I started this ministry. And then my brilliant pastor, modern evangelical, said, don't do it, Mike. We already have Chuck Swindoll. And um, who else? Oh, Charles Stanley. We already have them. We don't need any more teachers. What you need to do is start a buzz group. Start a, a discussion program. Typical modern evangelical trash. Good thing I was led by the Holy Spirit and smart enough, not smart enough, but by God's grace I didn't listen to that. But anyway, this same fella, he confided in me one day. Oh, he was so upset. Very upset because he was five years five years out of seminary and he wasn't making nearly as much money as he thought he should be. That's exactly what he said. So here I was, teaching the Word of God every opportunity I could, not taking a cent for it, working a secular job full time, doing scripture verse by verse, of course, you know, 
by faith. And he's complaining about not making enough money as he thought he should be. I didn't understand that type of thinking. I, I knew it was wrong. It was twisted, it was perverted, it was warped thinking for a so-called man of God to have that attitude. It made no sense to me. And actually, as he was saying that to me, I forgot to tell you this, as he was saying that to me, I had just concluded two years of teaching every single Saturday night at a special worship service at a town about 40 miles away. And I was never offered a single penny for doing it. Not a cent. And I never asked for anything either. Two years, every week, without fail. Now, it may have entered my mind that, that I, I should have received something because the Bible does say that the laborer is worthy of their pay and I really did put my heart into that. I, I studied. Of course I did. So it may have entered into my mind. You know, I'm not going to say anything, but these people are, you know, they probably should give something. But whatever. I just continued to do it. I did it because I, I counted it in honor to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and to minister the word to his people, whether they compensated me for it or not. I was doing the most important thing that I could do. And God says in verse 25 that to be a minister is to be commissioned by God. And mister, if you're commissioned by God, you're happy to preach and teach the word of God whether you get paid for it or not. If you're, if you're commissioned by God, that is a calling. That's not a career. That's not a profession. And if you're commissioned by God, you can't stand it if you're not preaching and teaching the Word of God. Whether you get paid for it or not, you've got to be preaching the Word of God. Like Paul said, Paul said, Woe is unto me if I don't preach the gospel. Jeremiah was commissioned by God. He cut the tar beat out of him. Not only did he not get any offerings, he was constantly getting the tar beat out of him, persecuted in this way and that way, mocked, ridiculed, thrown in dungeons, thrown down into a cistern, up to his knees in mud, hungry. He said, that's it. I'm going to quit. He tried quitting. He said, I'm not going to give the, get out the word of God anymore. I don't know how long that lasted, maybe a day. He said, I, I don't even think it lasted that long. He said, I couldn't quit. The Word of God burned in me. That's being called by God. And if your preacher, your pastor doesn't have that attitude, shame on him. You're going to the wrong church and you're supporting the wrong guy. You shouldn't give that guy a buck. Because he is making merchandise of something that is holy. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't be paid. I'm not saying you shouldn't send offerings of Scripture verse by verse. I do it every day because I ask for it every time because the labor is worthy of your pay. I'm just saying. If you're called by God, you do it whether you get anything or not. Most of my life, I've been teaching the Word of God for whatever it's been, 36, 37 years. The vast majority of my life, I work two jobs. Even when I pastor a church, pastor a church, Sunday morning service, Wednesday, for a long time Sunday night, radio in the morning on Sundays, for a while it was five days a week on a local radio station, television, worked my tail off. My brother-in-law told me one time, he said, Mike, I've never known anybody as poor as you. He was serious. <laughs> I never even thought about it. <clears throat> I'm not complaining, believe me. I never even thought about it. And I've never felt like a poor man. I, I'm not complaining, believe me. I'm trying to make a point here. I, I was called by God to do something and I was doing it. And that made me feel like a rich man. So that's why I never noticed it. I guess I was, but I didn't notice it. I always had food to eat. Never missed a meal unless I was fasting. 
always had gas for my car. My other brother-in-law said, Mike, your car is, is held together with uh, duct tape and wire. He went far from the truth. But I didn't, I didn't care. I, didn't, I was doing what God had called me to do. And I was content with that. And I still am. And I'm grateful to God. And that's the way it should be. And that's the way Paul was. It's not a career. 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to them God would make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. <clears throat> Without Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, there is no hope of glory. Without Jesus <clears throat> in your life as your Lord and Savior, your future is damnation in the lake of fire, burning and suffering, the worst torture that you can imagine times infinity. That's what you got without Jesus because he is our hope of glory. But if you repent and you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, asking him to save you from hell, then your future will be filled with happiness. You reject Jesus Christ, then I can say by the holy written word of God that you would have been better off if you had never been born. Which means that all of the good that you have enjoyed in this life, all of your sinful pleasure, all other pleasures that you have enjoyed in this life are going to be so overshadowed by the screaming and the burning and the torture that you will experience for all eternity that you won't even remember that you ever even cracked a smile, that you ever laughed, that you ever felt good for a second. You won't remember any of that. The torture is going to be so horrible. And you'll know it's never going to end. Jesus Christ is your only hope of glory. And you better take advantage of that right now before you die. Because after you die, it's going to be too late. Ten seconds after you die, you will be screaming and burning and charred and yet unable to go out of existence completely. You will wish that you could go out of existence. You may beg to go out of existence, but you can't because you're an immortal soul. Ten seconds after you die, you'll be screaming and burning and saying to yourself, I should have done it. I should have done it. I should have repented. I should not have hung on to that sin that I love so much. I knew the truth about Jesus. I just didn't want to give it up. My preacher said that I was a Christian because I prayed the sinner's prayer. I just was, I just was a, 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 a lukewarm Christian. I was just a, um, what do they call it, carnal Christian. But I was still saved. Nothing to worry about. I never repented. I should have done it. I should have done it. I should have received Jesus. I should have listened to that preacher. Moret is what I should have done. Because he told me to repent. Unlike my pastor, he told me to repent. He told me that you have to turn away from your sin. He told me that you had to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ as well as receiving him as Savior. He told me to do that. But all my evangelical friends just scoffed at it, said, you don't need to do that. Let's go listen to James Dobson or some other psychologist tell us that we need to build up our self-esteem. And you did. And now you're in hell. And you're going to say, I wish I would have listened to Moret. I wish I would have listened to the pure word of God that he was preaching. I wish I would have listened to this preacher that was preaching the same word of God because Moret wasn't the only one. I should have done it. But I didn't. Now I'm here. And now this horror will never end. You want that to be you? Is your sin worth that much to you? If it is, see you later. But I won't see you later. Carry on, mister. That's totally up to you. You know the truth. Study the whole Bible with me, Genesis through Revelation, at the Scripture Verse by Verse website. This is a proven ministry of teaching God's Word. 
for over, you can go back 35 years of archives. You can see that I have taught this way from the very beginning. From the first time a microphone was put in front of me, I have not changed. I have never sought to please men. I have never sought to water down the Word of God to be popular with anyone. It is a proven ministry. If you want to be a part of a ministry that is dedicated and has been dedicated now for over three decades to getting out the pure Word of God, you can be by praying for me. Pray for me. Pray for God's Word. Bang! Just like that, you're a part of this ministry. And I'd appreciate that so much. When you take a break from studying at the BibleVerseByVerse.com, you go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give us a Lord May Lead. That's another way you can be a part of this ministry. Let's stand together any way that we can and get out God's Word. It's the most important thing that we can do because an immortal soul is the most important thing there is. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.